Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. Paddy, how are you this week? I'm positively fantastic, Gary. The weather is absolutely delectable today and hopefully for the rest of the week. And that always brightens my mood. Um, we're in the last week. We're in the end game here now, Gary. You know, last week, gyms are open. Business is, you know, probably going to pick up, which is good and bad because I already fucking get a lack of sleep here, a lack of fucking relaxation in my life. But it is good for business perspective with anyone out there who's, you know, thinking about like, oh, should I go in? Should I message them now? Like, yeah, message now because in what is it, two weeks? What day is this coming out? The 31st? I don't know, whatever date it is. Uh, yeah. Anyway, look, we're closing coaching on the 14th of June. So, if you're like, oh, I want to get in with these guys, I'm going to get in contact with them in like, you know, three weeks, four weeks, whatever. I'm like, I'm sorry, we're basically full and we won't have space. So excuse me, get in contact now or don't get in contact. Anyway, Gary, look, we're not here to talk about the amount of spaces that we have available for coaching. Um, first of all, how is life for you? Because I know you've been in a, your your little thing that you do as a side hustle for when you're not at triage work you know and um, how is that for you and then also what are we talking about today life is excellent as you alluded to i'm on neurosurgery placement at the moment it's fun loving it learning lots all good and as you say the weather is absolutely beautiful today so long may it last for the purpose of today niceties aside we're discussing low energy availability and relative energy deficiency in sport or reds or just red okay um, this is an important topic and one that follows on from what we've discussed in the previous podcast or podcasts, because we've been discussing the topic of fat loss. And along with that comes the topic of low energy availability, because we're obviously consciously reducing calories and or increasing our energy expenditure when we're trying to lose body fat. Now, that is generally a healthful pursuit. Generally, that's a good thing for most people to be a bit leaner, like that's probably a good thing. Okay. However, there are trade-offs that come with uh, such attempts. And this is particularly the case in certain sports or activities um, that have very high energy outputs, high, very high energy demands, um, high training volumes, etc. And particularly sports that involve uh, body image or specific weight classes as you know important criteria you know examples of that would be like ballet dancing um obviously weight class sports in martial arts etc okay i'll give you a few i just have this written down from a page yeah if you've got a list go ahead again uh whatever i can't even think of the word <laughs> but anyway here's a few examples uh consistent with the etiology ethological role of low energy availability the triad or relative energy deficiency here uh, is most often observed in those who participate competitively or recreationally in sports that emphasize leanness and then given the examples number one endurance slash anti-gravitational sports so long distance running triad I can't even speak. Triathlons, road cycling, ski jumping, and high jumping, where a high body weight tends to restrict performance. So you can think of that. That's the first kind of category, this endurance, anti-gravitational sports, right? And then the second category, weight class sports, such as wrestling, judo, boxing, lightweight rowing, taekwondo, you know, like where specific weight requirements uh, must be met before competition. And then the third one is aesthetic sports. So like rhythmic or acrobatic gymnastics, figure skating, diving, synchronized swimming, uh, where, you know, subjective, where a subjective judging, where, if I could speak, where there is a subjective judging component, right? And you might be thinking, first of all, you're like, oh, well, I don't do sports. So this is, you know, irrelevant to me. Like I would argue that that third category, you know, kind of applies to a lot of people just looking to improve their body composition, you know, subjectively in their eyes, like you're basically in a, an aesthetic sport, you know, like I always kind of think of it in my mind. It's like, you're all basically amateur bodybuilders when you're going to the gym. That's the way you should think of it. Like if you were to go out and just recreationally, you know, do five aside, you'd be like, Oh, like I'm kind of like an amateur football player, you know, like there's obviously the layers to this, like degrees to it. Like obviously like the GAA is an amateur sport, but it's basically run professionally. So obviously there's levels to this shit, but you're basically for all intents and purposes, an amateur in this sport, you know, you're not doing this professionally. Right. So if you are an amateur bodybuilder, like what are you, you know, it's just someone who wants to change their physique that encompasses 
pretty much everyone that's in the gym to some degree or another. So you are, whether you believe it or not, effectively competing in an aesthetic sport when you are trying to like change your body composition. Now, obviously, look, that's me being like really inclusive with my criteria here, but that's the way you need to think about it because that is why what we're talking about today is actually important for you, even if you aren't in sports, right? Even if you aren't engaging in sports, there is still the possibility that you are in this kind of low energy availability, available, available state. And then you're also in this kind of, we'll call it disease, disease state of red S or reds or red or whatever fuck you want to call it. And that has been called by different names in the past, which I'm sure Gary will get into in a second. And so that's why it's important because you guys are basically all competing in amateur bodybuilding. Yep. That's effectively it, you know, because I suppose like, as you mentioned, a lot of those sports with uh, subjective judging criteria are those uh, that leave one susceptible to reds. And in this case, you are your own subjective judge and very often the harshest judge. So it's very clear that people who are pursuing fat loss and pursuing improvements in their physique absolutely go to the extremes with energy restriction and um, high training volumes that athletes do in some cases. So, you know, the word athlete in the female athlete triad or the word sport in reds is basically made redundant. Okay. So we want to think of this overall as a problem of low energy availability. Now, zooming out for a second and looking back, as Patty said, this was referred to in the past as the female athlete triad. Um, that started around, around 25 years ago or so. That terminology start to be, started to be used. And it, the triad effectively encompassed three things, as suggested. Disordered eating, um, not necessarily any particular um, diagnosable eating disorder, but disordered eating as a kind of a broader category. Amenorrhea or menstrual dysfunction. Okay, so amenorrhea means the absence of a period. So obviously, we're talking about the female athlete triad here. And then osteoporosis or low bone mineral density. Okay, um, osteoporosis is just a basic, a specific clinical criteria that has to be met, but we're talking about low bone mineral density overall, really. Uh, but that evolved over the years. Okay, so in 2007, it was modified to um, just to, to be the relative energy deficiency, uh, deficiency in sport. I think it's almost better to just say relative energy deficiency syndrome, because then they could keep the reds. But anyway, in sport, um, and that obviously makes it um, more inclusive, like it's not a female specific issue. It just happens to be the case that it's very prevalent. Uh, in female athletes uh, for multiple different reasons. Uh, there's often uh, often the, the aesthetic element that we were discussing, for example, ballet, dancing, figure skating, et cetera. They're often more female dominated sports. So it might be observed there. There's also the consideration that when we're talking about female athletes and we look at those sports, gym, gymnasts, for example, um, often will specialize in their sport at a very young age. So you actually have more of a concern about these problems of relative energy deficiency in sport um, in those younger athletes, because they may never actually, um, you know, gain the benefits in, let's say, bone mass or normal menstrual uh, function that is so important to that period um, of their life. Okay, so that's there's some of the reasons why it initially was more of a female consideration. But obviously, as we then kind of consider this as a, a condition or a syndrome that can affect males and females, we obviously have to broaden our criteria. And that's effectively what has happened. So when you look at relative energy uh, deficiency, uh, effectively what you're considering are, yes, menstrual cycle dysfunctions, but more broadly, you know, hormonal dysfunctions in general. So, um, for example, when we talk about the menstrual cycle, effectively what's happening is that because you have low energy availability, you lose the normal pulsatility of GnRH, which is an important regulator of ovarian function. You get reductions in luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, and that's basically what leads to uh, the loss of your period or the loss of a normal menstrual cycle. There is a spectrum there from oligomenorrhea, where you just have variations in menstrual cycle length to the amenorrhea where you actually have the absence of your menstrual cycle okay obviously additional problems come with that with reproductive function in terms of fertility as well okay so all of those things um, are basically it's basically a state of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea and what the reason the word functional is in there is effectively because 
it's not an organic cause. So it's not the result of um, some condition that, you know, needs to be treated as such medically or surgically. Rather, it's the case that this is actually reversible with behavioral modification. Okay. Um, so that's what you're looking at on the female side, but uh, on the just, male just, side, just yeah, go ahead. As well, like it is important as well, because what, what you noted that this, this affects you differently throughout your lifespan. Like it mm. is more of a concern in say a younger athlete, especially for women like this and Gary will get onto the males in a second, but like, it is more of a concern for women, especially at a younger age, purely because like there is obviously categorizations within that kind of amenorrhea, like, you know, uh, we'll say a, a lack of a menstrual cycle. That's not necessarily true, but like, we'll just call it a lack of a menstrual cycle. Like, obviously that's different if you have never had one versus you used to have one and now it's gone, right? Like that's, there's, there's different etiologies to that in terms of what goes on. And then also different downstream effects. And it's like primary versus secondary amenorrhea and stuff and like that. You might think it's like, oh, this is all just kind of irrelevant. Like it's fine. But like, if you are missing like key developmental periods of your life, you know, in terms of like, you didn't have a period until you were 17 because you were chronically in a low energy availability. Like you still might be getting some like, I don't know, estrogen signaling, uh, not enough to like ha actually be in, uh, like to actually have your period and stuff. So you might get differences in like height outcomes. And this is actually a little bit more prevalent in like men, for example, because you know, you'll see individuals that are in weight class sports. Like I used to box and like, you see individuals that like they be always trying to cut down to get to a lower weight class and you'd see them compared to like their brothers who didn't do that and all of a sudden you're like you see them at 18 and they're like six inches shorter than their brothers you know it's like once you miss these key developmental periods it's like it's not like you can regain them again you know like yeah obviously you can go through them but it's a different time course you know so like if you started your like menstrual cycles at 16 versus starting it at 14 like there are differences now again 16 to 14 not a huge difference but if you started at 18 it's like there's that you're basically like a decade behind everyone else you know and that's not a, a huge issue that's not to say like oh like you're so far behind blah 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 but it's like these are developmental periods it's like the, your like brain functioning depends on this like the actual like you know structures within your brain like e everything depends on this key hormonal signaling so it's not just a case of like oh, i didn't have my period it's no big deal you know and the one that's probably most uh relevant to this discussion because it is obviously one of the we'll call it the diagnostic criteria is that bone mineral density we'll call it bone health because it's probably a better terminology right and like that is clearly especially in women like facilitated like good bone health is facilitated by good hormonal systems at play like it you know estrogen estrogen and like uh, calcium metabolism and everything like they're they're intrinsically linked so you might think oh it's just no big deal i just don't have a period or i don't like it's, it's fine i like, guess not fine you know and obviously it becomes more apparent in individuals that are exposing themselves to you'll call them uh high forces in terms of like you play a sport you know like even gymnastics and all of a sudden you, you've done this jump you've done this whatever spinning backflip whatever fuck gymnasts do and you've landed it a thousand times and now all of a sudden you land it and like your fucking femur fractures you know like splinters into a million pieces because you're like oh you actually have fucking shocking bone mineral density because you've been so energy restricted you know it's like that's potentially a we'll call it a career like sporting career ending injury you know um and also it's like this is this is it's not like you can just necessarily get this bone mineral density back you know some of it again depending on the age depending on all that kind of stuff it's like some of this is being laid down at an earlier age that it's not like you can just play catch up with this stuff you know and it's like okay you don't see the effects of that until you're 70 or 60 or whatever when you're like oh i have osteoporosis osteoarthritis osteo fucking everything and you're like i wonder how this happened and it's like yeah like you've basically mistreated your bones at a key developmental period you know yeah, absolutely. And I think that's an important distinction is the fact that like amenorrhea or, or menstrual cycle dysfunction more broadly does not exist in a vacuum. Like it exists as a side effect of the hormonal changes that also affect other systems within the body, 
bone health being a massive one. Okay. So, you know, bone health is something that peaks quite early in life in terms of your peak bone mass. Um, you know, you're, you've accumulated about 90% or so of your peak bone mass by the time you're 18. So you can imagine if you've got a young gymnast who, yeah, she, you know, she's, let's say training since she's six years old and, you know, she's gone to the Olympics by 14, 15 and everything fantastic. But if she's been, you know, maintaining a low energy um, diet throughout that period of time in order to maintain a low body weight for her role as a gymnast. Um, and she's, you know, had delay in the onset of her periods, then it's called menarche, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Menarche. And, and as you can, as you can probably tell there, like that's clearly a problem from the perspective of the initial accrual of that peak bone mass. Okay. So you're actually not even getting to the point where you have more to lose. And that's one of the things that's really important for women because, um, like what, what you tend to see is that in that postmenopausal period, that's really when you start to move along that spectrum of osteopenia to osteoporosis, because you get the loss of estrogen during that postmenopausal period. And that is effectively a, a good thing. Like as in estrogen is typically a good thing for your bone health, but also for your cardiovascular health. Okay. So you don't want that to be happening to you earlier on in life. The cardiovascular and, and neurological health as well. Like, you know, fucking yeah. dementia, senality, fucking any of those stuff. Yeah, like it, it, these things are, are very wide reaching within the body. The other example I gave there was the cardiovascular system, like estrogen is somewhat cardioprotective. And again, if you're having these, um, this decrease in estrogen as a result of uh, relative energy deficiency, then again, that can compromise cardiovascular health. Okay. So despite the fact that you might be lean, you might look great, you might be doing so many things that would generally contribute to good cardiovascular health. And um, you may be missing out on some of those pieces of the puzzle and potentially causing problems. Okay. Other things that are probably fairly intuitive, or, um, if you've, you know, been in the health space for a while would be effects on immunity. So if you've got, um, low energy availability, it, you know, it kind of makes sense that your immune system isn't going to be mounting a very robust response, uh, to infection. Okay. Because it is a very energy intensive process to be able to, you know, you're basically making all of these new, new cells on a needs must basis, you know, that the, the, a pathogen is identified and then you need to divert all of your energy resources to try to take care of that. And obviously if low energy or if there's not much energy available, that's going to be a difficult thing to do. Okay. So you're generally going to have decreased immunity. A lot of people will actually have experienced this, whether or not they've experienced relative energy def deficiency during times of stress, for example. Okay. You know, if you've been, even if it, it might be a training specific context where you've been training super hard for a period of time, maybe you were dieting at the same time, you might be more susceptible to a cold. Similar thing happens to people around exam periods as well. Okay. So when you're in a very stressed state, whether it be energy related or not necessarily energy related, you tend to be more susceptible to uh, infections. Okay. Um, other things then would be, you know, protein synthesis, obviously uh, you're not going to be making gains. If you're trying to maintain your muscle mass and you're trying to, or trying to build muscle mass, then maintaining low energy availability for long periods of time, obviously isn't in your best interest. Any bodybuilder who's gone through a contest prep will know that. Okay. And then, you know, finally, as I said, cardiovascular health, um, we've already discussed that. I think, I think that's, that's most of the things you need to be thinking about as side effects, but obviously there's significant psychological side effects here as well. Okay. Um, they may seem a little bit fluffier or less clear, or less well-defined, but it's very obvious to anyone who has been in that period where, especially as you move along the disordered eating spectrum, that there can be significant psychological comorbidities, whether that be um, issues with uh, body image or self-esteem, uh, potentially depression, anxiety, all of these things can coexist as part of this presentation. Yeah. And this is like, I would argue like, and like this is weird because obviously like I like the biochemistry, I like the physiology. That's the kind of stuff that I, I really like the most with all this health and fitness stuff that anyone who listens to this podcast, they already know that. Um, but I think the psychological, we'll call it damage, is probably worse than the physiological stuff, right? Because, and the reason I say that is because a lot of this physiological stuff, especially if there is a, a timely intervention and like, you know, you've got some forward thinking people, a lot of this can just be reversed relatively easily, right? But those psychological issues that you potentially develop, like if you develop this kind of disordered eating pattern, that doesn't just change by reversing the energy balance equation you know so it's like those kind of things they are 
harder to deal with. And obviously that's going to be different for everyone. Like obviously one of the, the criteria for this is like disordered eating, you know, and that can really run, run the gamut of like what that actually means for this individual. Like there's, there's so much within that. There's so much to unpack within that. And depending on how that affects you, there's, there's going to be a quicker or slower recovery of where you want to be. And we'll talk about that later on in the thing. But what I want to do also move on to before we just you know dive in a little bit deeper is to say, because I interrupted you, uh, is that there are differences between like male and female presentations of this. You know, we were just talking about before the podcast in terms of like, how would you like realistically, like just talking about like, you know, obviously this changed from the, the female athlete triad, right? Because it was obviously very presentable in female athletes first of all like gary was saying it's very prevalent in them because a lot of female sports emphasize a certain body type you know we'll use gymnastics because we've been talking about it like the unfortunate thing about gymnastics for women is a lot of them do effectively well, quote unquote peak very early and that's because the styles of gymnastics the styles that are rewarded in gymnastics require a, a certain physique right for, for female gymnastics anyway whereas for male gymnastics different things are rewarded and it's more so like we'll call it strength you know which obviously takes a longer time to accumulate like you're not going to have a 14 year old boy strength wise compete with like a 28 year old man you know like that's that's fairly obvious however if it's a certain physique that we're trying to create here like and it's we're rewarding this like younger female physique like there's, there's different trade-offs here. And this is again, one of the weird things because like in like certain sports, like gymnastics, they almost want, like, especially something like, you know, ballet, for example, that's a, another big one. Like they kind of want to delay that men arc. They kind of want to delay that menstrual cycle, like onset purely by virtue of like, they don't want say wider hips. They don't want like boobs, you know, they don't want these like quote unquote classical female, like uh, anatomy. You know, like they don't want that for the sport. You know, they don't want like you go into a like a ballet, like you're not seeing the the lead balletist. I don't know what the fucking word is. Um, they're not, you know, uh, your classical curvy female. You know, like that's not what they are. They're like no, they're basically like straight up and down. Like a lot of them are obviously like you know more muscled as well because obviously they're they're athletes. Um, but there's a certain physique that is rewarded, right? So that it's kind of kind of shit because like you you could be the best at your sport you know and then all of a sudden in any other context you're like oh people would kill for your physique in terms of like say you just are a woman and you just develop like bigger boobs you develop a bigger bum you know you have this classic like hourglass physique it's like now what you've been training for your whole life in terms of this sport you're like all right you're out you're you're not the, the physique that we want for this you know so you can see why people kind of want to be in this low energy available state to you know actually get these hormonal uh, differences that occur and like that's it's kind of fucked up you know it's, it's kind of really fucked up <laughs> um but that is something to consider as well right but the the thing we were talking about before the the podcast uh, started was because like how do you actually go about diagnosing this in men right because if we're talking about the the the, the criteria it's like you know uh disordered eating menstrual dysfunction you know poor bone health like as a generality, like men have better bone health, right? And that there's there's a number of mechanisms for that, but like we won't talk about it right now. But let's just assume like that's kind of, you're not going to see that as prevalently, you know? Like obviously you are, like if you go measure it, you're gonna be like, all right, like you clearly have less bone mineral density than someone else who's of the similar age, et cetera, right? But it's not like you're going to get as like catastrophic uh, realization of like, oh, like here's a fracture or here's a whatever going on. Like that's going to be at a lower prevalence because of you know males having higher bone mineral density uh, from the start, right? So that's kind of like, you, you have poorer bone health, but it's not as obvious, right? Disordered eating, like disordered eating, especially as a male athlete who's probably larger, like you can probably get away with more calories. So you can kind of get away with having this, these disordered eating patterns because it still looks like you're eating a lot of food. Whereas like a female who is eating like 1200 calories, it's like, you can kind of see those disordered eating patterns emerge because they start, you know, having to restrict below like 1200 calories. And, you know, you can see these manifestations a lot easier. Whereas a guy who's like, oh yeah, I have to, you know, eat 2000 calories to maintain this. You know, it's like, it's a lot easier to make people believe that you're eating more and that you have a, a healthier relationship with food, right? So the disordered eating 
again in men it can be kind of masked right and then obviously like menstrual dysfunction like men don't menstruate so how are you going to like diagnose that how are you going to use that as a criteria and we were just i was just saying before the podcast to gary that like what do you use as a criteria it's like how do you like obviously if you go from having like your regular 28 day cycle and then it goes down to like oh now you're like six months without a cycle it's like yeah that's clearly obvious that something is going on here but how do you track that as a guy like if there's some sort of hormonal disturbance how do you go from like oh yeah i was actually getting like 10 boners per day like randomly and now it's gone down to seven you know like no one's tracking that stuff you know like gary how many boners did you have today you don't fucking know well maybe you don't because you're a weirdo but anyway um like you know you don't know that stuff right or it's like oh how do you track it during the night maybe like what's that called uh uh two mesalent whatever the fuck that word is um whatever anyway like, like you can track that stuff at night like with certain apparatus and stuff um but like how, how like how are you actually going to notice that it's all it all becomes subjective unless you're getting like blood work you know which a lot of athletes obviously aren't getting blood work regularly because why would they be doing that you know they're, they're just especially if you're like an amateur athlete you're not gonna be like oh i need to get my blood work done every eight weeks or whatever you know it's like you're, you're not doing that so in guys it's a lot easier to miss this stuff and that's why like this is one of the very very few we'll call them syndromes diseases issues that has far more research in women than in men like most other things it's the opposite way around right it's like unless obviously it's a very female specific issue, like obviously, you know, like menopause or something. It's like, there's, there's no need for guy research in this. <laughs> um, but like, it's one of the very few issues that like it affects both sexes, but the overwhelming majority of the research is done in women. Right. And like, usually it's the other way around where the overwhelming majority of the research is done in men, or even like, if it's done in like animals, it's done in male animals because they used to think that the menstrual cycle was a confounding factor rather than something that you have to fucking account for. <laughs> um, so like it is like in guys, this has kind of flown under the radar and it's obviously like whatever it was, I think it was 2007 uh, that it was only like, that's, that's when it was like, Oh, this is actually an issue for guys. You know, it's like, that's 15 years ago. Well, it's just less than 15 years ago. It was like, that's, that's a blink of a fucking eye in the, the, the grand scale of things. Absolutely. You know, and I mean, like there are, there are subjective elements as well, obviously. And I think like for males, this can definitely be, well, for males and females, like subjective, uh, you know, libido is, is something that can actually be quite helpful. Um, and this is something that I ask my clients about, you know, all the time, you know, how's your libido and just make it a kind of a casual thing. And you, you do absolutely. That, do you? Huh? you just text them that, do you? Yeah. Just randomly. I don't know. <laughs> it's on our check-in document, <laughs> but um yeah, we've, uh, you know, it, it is something that's important because like that's something that we actually see at both sides of the spectrum where typically if someone is, you know, relatively deep into the higher BMIs in terms of obesity, like libido can be compromised and it's something that tends to improve as someone engages in more healthful practices and begins to lose weight. But then also someone who has spent far too long dieting in this relative energy deficiency state as they begin to get their energy uh, availability back up and, and gain a little bit of body fat, generally libido will go up as well. Okay. So subjective libido is something that can be helpful. If you're someone who's been dieting for a long period of time and you've noticed that all oh, my libido is down, I've also noticed that um, your hunger is up, your energy levels are lower, you're more fatigued, recovery is compromised, sleep is compromised, your mood is compromised. All these things go together um, to point potentially in that uh, direction. And you know, when we're talking about these, something as, I guess, broad sweeping as energy availability, clearly we're not going to have a very clear definition as to what the cutoff is and what exactly constitutes or doesn't constitute it. Because your, your energy availability affects literally every system in the body and syst uh, the systemic um, threshold at which it may, may manifest symptoms might vary not only on a system by system level, but also considerably between individuals. And that's what brings, it up, brings us on to the next part of this discussion, which is what is energy availability <laughs> and what, co what constitutes low energy availability? Because we've, you know, spent a great deal of time using this term and, um, and it's, it, it, it does have some definitions, okay? So energy availability is the difference between your energy intake, so your calories in that you may be tracking, and your energy expenditure through exercise, okay? So exercise energy expenditure. So when we talk about a calorie deficit on its own, we talk about that being the difference between energy in 
an energy out. That energy out is everything that you're expending. But here with energy availability, we're talking specifically about the difference between the energy in and the energy that's expended through exercise, okay? And obviously that's gonna vary hugely, okay? And that's why it's so relevant to athletes because those numbers can climb quite high, okay? Just, just, just on this to jump in. Yeah. This is why we did the podcast in this order. So if you listen to the last one and you listen to the constrained energy model, or I think that was the last one, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, talk about the constrained energy model. Now you start to put two and two together and you start going, okay, wait a second. High energy expenditure through exercise, low energy intake. Let me just think back to that constrained energy model. Oh, something's going on here. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I would really recommend listening to this, that podcast, because we basically left this hole open to discuss this further in this podcast. So do go back and listen to that if you have not. Um, so yeah, in, t- in terms of like quantifying that, then the way we would quantify that would be, um, so your, your energy, your energy availability is effectively calculated as a unit of the amount of calories per kilogram of fat free mass per day. Okay. So a number, a number that's thrown around as kind of, you know, adequate energy availability or optimal energy availability um, in females, this is mainly coming from. So just keep that in mind because um, females tend to be a little bit more, um, our female physiology tends to be more conservative with reproductive resources. So, you know, they don't want our, the adaptations tend to happen a little bit more aggressively. Um, but again, it remains to be seen how exactly it manifests between the sexes. Um, 45 kilo, 45 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass is effectively what seems to be the optimal level. Once we get below that, there's clearly going to be inter-individual differences as to you know where problems start to manifest. But 30 calories per kilo uh, of fat-free mass is the level at which we're typically considering, right, this is low energy availability. There's research that varies between 25 and 30. And again, it's just inter-individual um, effects here. But just to put that into real terms, because it mightn't necessarily make sense, you're like, what do you mean fat-free mass, et cetera? Like if you've got, let's say, I'll just take myself 80 kilo male, okay, or a little bit over that now, but let's go with 80 kilos round numbers. You're jacked these days. Yeah. 80 kilos, that's, let's say 12% body fat, I'm probably 13 or 14, but let's say 12. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, about, <laughs> that's about 70 or that's 70 kilos of fat-free mass, okay? So we multiply that by 30 to put me in the low criteria. It's 2,100 calories. So that 2,100 calorie value is the energy availability um, between energy in and the amount I'm expending expending during exercise. So that would look like, let's say I'm eating 3,500 calories and I'm expending 1,400 through my workouts, 2,100 remaining, would be considered to be low energy uh, availability or just on that threshold as I go below there. And that is like in and around roughly where my resting metabolic rate would be Um, maybe a little bit higher, but around there. Okay. If we were to measure it. And that's kind of one of the parameters that relates to this is that when we begin to, you know, expend so many calories relative to our energy intake that we're now um, digging into our resting metabolic metabolic rate, that they're the types of adaptations that we start to see at that point. Okay. Because we're not, we're not putting enough energy into the system to sustain basic physiological functions along with the high volume of exercise um, that we're, that we're doing. Yeah. And like, it's really important to understand that this is fat-free mass. And first of all, yeah. most people don't know their fat-free mass, like Gary's estimating his body weight there you know and going oh yeah there's we're not estimating his body weight sorry his body fat you know like oh yeah 12 percent, 13 percent, and doing some quick maths on that um but like that's that's good enough for this right because there is a level of inter-individual individual inter-individual variance um so like it, it doesn't really matter what you're using these calculations for is a rough idea of where it's at right and that kind of 30 kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass per day is a good kind of middle of the road like that's kind of well, not even middle of the road that kind of bottom end for women and that kind of 30 to 45 is that kind of you know this i'd be fairly confident if someone was eating 45 calories per kilo of fat-free mass per day i'd be like look you're probably not in low energy uh, availability you know or you're not in a relative energy deficiency you know and um, but 
for men, the numbers are a little bit different in terms of like, well, from what I've seen in the research now, again, like this, this stuff is actually relatively poorly researched from what you would like to see in terms of like, like having very clear numbers or having very clear like criteria. Like we don't know if there's like racial differences. We don't know like ethnic, I can't even speak today, ethnic differences. Like we don't know all the stuff that goes into this and there it does appear that there are some differences between like you know ethnicities and stuff and, and that could be due to like a fucking load of different things different gene polymorphisms etc right so like this is poorly understood but for men it seems to be in that kind of 20 to 25 kilocals per kg uh, of fat-free mass per day right so that's just a rough estimate now as gary said like that's that's like it, it's kind of when you're doing it out, it, it, if you try to do the maths out yourself, you have to actually be clear on what you're actually calculating, right? Because it's very easy to go, oh, so the number I need to eat per day is 20 to 25 kilocalories per kg of fat-free mass, and I'm, I'm all fucking good, you know? And it's like, that's, that's not actually what you're calculating, right? Like, there's a little bit more to it. And this, again, it's a little bit harder because we're also confounding this by, well, not confounding it, we're actually putting into the equation here that we're actually calculating. It's like, what is your exercise output? Which again, most people don't know, like you're not tracking it. Like we recently got like whoops so we could track all of our like expenditure or like cardio output, like during like jujitsu and stuff. We're just, we're just trying them. Not a fucking, they, we don't sponsor or we don't sponsor them. They don't sponsor us. Not a fucking shout out. Well, it is a shout out, but it's like, we're just using it to see because a lot of our clients have them. So it's like, let's see what the, what's the crack with them. Right. Um, so most people don't know how much calories they're putting out in a day. Most people don't know how much calories they're putting out during exercise, during sport, during whatever. And it is a little bit of guesswork. Right. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like these numbers are not hard and fast rules. It doesn't fucking matter. Like you could be eating at 45 kilogram kilocalories per kg of fat free mass per day and still be experiencing red S, right? Like your exercise could be through the fucking roof. You could be doing three hour jogs in the morning, a fucking resistance training session in the afternoon, and then going out and I don't know, fucking going on a, 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 a rowing ride later on. I don't fucking know what you do with your life. You know, like you could be expending a fuckload of energy right? Throughout the whole day. And as a result of that, you could be in a position where you're eating a ton of calories, but you're still digging into that kind of resting energy or that uh, resting, or I can't even speak, that basal metabolic rate, right? So like this, this is important to understand like what you are actually calculating. So Gary, just explain that again. What, what do these numbers actually pertain to? Like, how do I put this into practice, right? Like, how do I actually say you're a coach or say you are an individual that's doing a lot of exercise. How are we using these? Right. Cause obviously that's an example there, but just kind of reiterate that. Yeah. Like personally, if I, if I was putting this into practice, what I'd be thinking about is, okay, firstly, do I have a reason to believe that someone might have a problem associated with um, energy availability? Because this isn't something that you just take away and put into your coaching practice, you know, just for the, for the sake of tracking something else. Okay. You've got a client, let's say I have a client and he or she, they feel fantastic. Okay. Feeling great, libido, on fire, performance, unreal, no injuries, regular menstrual cycle, plenty of erections, etc. whatever. Like, I, I don't, you know, you're all good. <laughs> you're fine. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, it, it's also not the case that you need to be worried about this over short periods of time. So if someone's going through an eight week fat loss phase, and we're, you know, being relatively aggressive with the deficit. It's not like you can't go below these numbers for short periods of time. Where this really starts to become important is where you have an athlete, let's say, that's exercising for long periods of time. Um, let's say they've, they're an athlete, uh, they've been in, competing in a sport for eight years, they've been eating in a similar way all through that time. And, you know, they've maintained the same body weight, they're quite lean, and they've got symptoms associated with that this this is where that starts to become a problem and again what i've said is that you're generally looking at somewhere between 25 and 30 kilo, kilocalories per kilogram of fat-free mass as being that threshold at which you're likely um to be experiencing the the symptoms or manifestations of relative energy deficiency in sport okay and again energy in so if it's 3500 calories minus energy out through exercise specifically so exercise activity thermogenesis is what we would refer to it previously 
Um, let's say that's 1400 2100 calories is the difference there between 3500 and 1400 and therefore that 2100 calories would be the remaining energy availability okay because it's the energy that's available for metabolic processes that are not specific to the um, exercise process itself okay obviously the those processes are still affected by the fact that you're recovering from exercise and whatnot um but that's effectively what you're looking at. Now, the reason I make a, a strong point of considering whether or not you're just in, a, in an aggressive fat loss phase is because I could personally, let's say, drop down to a, a calorie intake for a few weeks of 1800 calories while burning 800 calories a day through exercise. My energy availability would then be a thousand calories per day, okay, at, at 80 kilos, 70 kilos of. Uh, fat-free mass, like that's far below that threshold that we've mentioned previously. But the point there is that that's a short-lived um, process and I'm making up the extra energy availability um, through, you know, the, the body fat that I'm actually mobilizing and using for fuel. Okay. So if I was to stay there long-term, obviously that'd be a problem. Okay. And that's when you start to get those decreases in metabolic rates and all of the other complications that we discussed. Okay. The other thing to, to consider here as well is that if, if working with a client who um, has these types of symptoms, let's say, where they may be suspect of low energy availability, they may have had the metabolic adaptations um, already and as a result are at a lower metabolic rate. They might have a low calorie intake and be maintaining their weight. So it's not just, it's a person could be maintaining their weight and still have low energy availability, okay? It's not, it's, it's not synonymous with being in an energy deficit and that's kind of the important thing here um, because, because we've discussed calorie deficit, that concept um, greatly in the last few episodes. And I think this... Uh, concept if it's new to you might be a little bit more complicated to understand but just note that the, the the energy deficit and energy availability are not the same thing and that you can absolutely have low energy availability while maintaining the same body weight okay and this is particularly true for athletes with very high training volumes and who are very lean as well and that's the other thing to to note here is that although we're, the energy availability itself is an important uh, factor there are other factors as well um, that come into this, such as how lean you are already, because although it's not encompassed within that specific equation, body fat is a fuel store. And as we've discussed previously, adipose tissue itself does secrete um, certain hormones, one of those being leptin and leptin levels um, very much uh, are tied in with all of the physiology that's relevant to relative, relative energy deficiency in sport, including things like um, your reproductive function. Okay. And another thing that goes along with that, then again, is carbohydrate availability specifically. Okay. So lower carbohydrate diets are more likely to exacerbate these problems of low energy availability because carbohydrates are um, more stimulatory of leptin secretion and insulin secretion at a given level of calorie intake and both leptin and insulin as well as other hormones are really important for the signaling processes um, related to uh, bone uh, bone health that we've discussed so bone turnover uh, and then also reproductive function as well so if you're on a low low carbohydrate diet you're very lean you're cutting your calories and you're exercising loads that's really the point at which you've got that recipe um, especially over the long term for some of these complications. 100% Gary, that was just absolute straight fire. Um, but yeah, like if you use the same equation, not the same equations, it's the equations that we gave in the last episode in terms of like, you've got this constrained energy model and it seems to be up to that kind of 1.8 to 2.2 times your like basal metabolic rate. And then you try to work out, you're like, okay, so maybe if I did that, and then also let's say again, like you got 2.5, as we said in the, the episode, the previous episode, like it goes up to that, right? Like even with that, like this is a further modification of those numbers, you know, like this gives you more clarity of those numbers in terms of like how your heart, like how the, we'll call it the physiological stuff is being affected, you know, rather than the, the exercise stuff. Like this is giving you a rough number of like where you don't want to dig into the physiological energy stores. We'll call them that, right. In terms of like this LEA, this, uh, 
like energy availability or this low energy availability, like that energy availability part, like this is giving you a rough number of where you want to keep that at if you are looking for peak health. And this is something that you need to understand because like Gary said, like this, while it is influenced by like body fat levels, for, for example, because obviously look, we're using fat free mass here as the, the number. So it's, you know, without your fat mass, um, but fat does like adipose tissue does actually do a lot in the body as well. And obviously it's a fuel source. So it gives you some buffer time before you might start actually feeling the effects of this low energy availability. Right. But to further confound things, just because you regain your fat like let's say you get lean and then you regain fat that you lost that doesn't mean that you're in like high energy availability that doesn't mean that you're supplying your body with the amount of food that it needs because this is a common thought process where it's like oh well if i'm gaining fat surely that means i'm in you know a high energy available state and that's just not the case like you could be gaining fat but it's because your exercise, for example, has gone down dramatically and your calories are now the exact same, you know, or like that's not necessarily relevant to this discussion, but you could still be in a position where your actual energy availability is still low. Like that number of whatever fucking 30 to 45 um, or 20 to 25, 20 to 30 for guys, like you could still be below that but gaining fat, right? And that's a really fucked up thing to uh, conceptualize or think through because how do you actually deal with that as an individual where you're like, okay, well, do I now cut my exercise out? Do I cut my exercise down? Like I'm gaining fat. Like how, how do I deal with this low energy availability for these like hormonal functions and all these other things when I am gaining fat. I don't want to be gaining fat. And in reality, it's like, like there's that classic one of, uh, there was a study on a female bodybuilder and it took her, what was it? 72, 71 weeks, something like that to like regain her menstrual function after a bodybuilding show, despite getting back to her previous like body fat levels, like, you know, before prep uh, body fat levels. So her body fat was where it was beforehand, but that doesn't mean that there was enough time to recover all these physiological functions. So like that, that can be hard to deal with as an athlete where you're like, again, your whole, character being whatever is dependent on you looking a certain way you know um and that's just unfortunately the 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 look of the draw to have to deal with this stuff like you're probably going to have to get fat for a while you know and that's the truth you know (laughs) there's no two ways around it like obviously there are a few different ways that we can navigate this better but most of them either either way like it's a hard swill to follow swill to follow what the fuck am i even saying hard pill to swallow um either way because like you're obviously going to have to modify your exercise habits if you're going to try leave more calories available for you know your actual fucking metabolism your actual physiology and most athletes don't want to do that most people who enjoy working out don't want to do that so they're like no i need to keep my exercise high and it's like okay well then we need to add more calories in here and then what do people do when they do that they're like oh i have so much more energy for my exercise and now their exercise that was an 800 calorie expenditure event now it's a 1200 calorie energy expenditure event because they're like oh yeah i felt like i had so much more energy on the field so you know i did some extra sprints after the workout and i did extra here and i actually added in an extra day because you know i feel more fueled and it's like it's like we're not able you can't do both you can't burn the candle at both ends you know it's like you have to eat more and usually you have to exercise a little bit less if you want to get this stuff under control and like there are a lot more interventions than just that like especially like you know bone mineral density like you know bone health it's like there's more that goes into that like we'll probably do a podcast on that entirely in in the future in terms of like like there's loads of stuff in that but like even stuff as simple as like you know getting sufficient vitamin d getting sufficient like calcium getting sufficient like vitamin k like there's so many different things that we can do to support like better cardiovascular health and uh, better bone mineral density and um, that are just not related to energy expenditure and there's people out there that deal with there's papers out there that go in depth into how do we actually deal with this stuff and we want to just keep this to like the the energy discussion in this current part of the, the podcast series but that's just a bit of information for you guys to you know digest and start thinking about now i know a lot of you don't necessarily work with athletes that are expending this much energy but i know a lot of people are in a position 
uh, especially coaches themselves um, and especially individuals who are trying to eat very little and train a lot like they're in positions where they basically are in this you know relative energy deficient state and that or syndrome as you said earlier on it's like and that is something to be aware of because there are some very negative outcomes of being in this state and while it's okay for a little while, you know, like eight weeks, who cares, you know, 16 weeks, okay, maybe we might start seeing some more deleterious effects from this, but there comes a stage where it's like, yeah, you've lost like 30% of your bone density. It's like, that's going to take you the next 10 years to get that back, <laughs> you know, if you get it back. It's like, you know, it's like, like, what are you going to do with that? You know, so it's like, you need to pay attention to this stuff. It's not just a case of like, you can exercise more and eat less and just get better fat loss. It's like, yeah like you can burn that candle for a little while but at a certain point it's like you've burnt that candle out yes sir I don't that's think it. yeah that's the energy availability okay now we do have coaching spaces available for two weeks okay so uh the gyms open up guys today week in ireland okay uh, so if you are interested in engaging with our coaching service, it would be wise to inquire. Um, if you inquire today or tomorrow or even Wednesday, you'll likely be able to, to get started, you know, in time for the gym's reopening. Okay, so do get in touch ASAP. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can make that return to the gym a smooth process. Uh, very often people will return to the gym after breaks uh, from doing so and put themselves at higher risk of injury or suboptimal results or they'll just get so excited with the novelty that they won't settle into a good plan and you know it's, it's just it's just not making the most of a time period where you're actually going to be really sensitive to training and you're probably going to be quite motivated given the amount of time that the gyms have been closed for so uh yeah let's make the most of it if you're interested do get in touch okay this, you, spurred but, is about, like, this is a time as well where people all get like call it like shiny object syndrome it's like you know there's a lot of stuff going on like likely you haven't seen your mates you haven't seen your friends you know whatever like you know you just want to go out maybe go on the piss a few nights maybe fucking even just go down to the fucking park together i don't know whatever like you what whatever rules you've been following for the last while to keep you yourself safe and your family safe like you know they're somewhat coming to an end now a lot of people are vaccinated a lot of people are in a a better position um like health wise and um, a lot of people are in a worse position health wise you know obviously like psychologically as well especially um but like there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel now and people can kind of get shiny object syndrome and kind of think about like their training it can kind of go on a back foot in terms of you know they probably haven't had the best last four months or so you know it's like oh like just haven't been motivated to train at home for basically the last year and a half nearly fucking two years um and now it's kind of like, all right, let's get back into the gym. But then you're kind of thinking to yourself like, oh, it's just not going to be the same for a while. I want to go out in the piss or I want to do this. And you can kind of sell yourself on like, oh, I'll just start next month or I'll start the month after or I'll start whatever. And that's just not a good mindset to get in. Like, even if it is a case that you're doing one, two sessions per week back in the gym or back training, like that will stand to you, you know, like, it will improve your health to whatever the extent that one or two sessions per week can improve your health, you know, and it might not be the exact thing you need to do. And obviously you might be in a case where it's like, look, you don't want to work with us because you just want to get back into the rhythm of things before you work with us, before you fucking hire a coach, hire a trainer, do whatever. But this is stuff to just be aware of, you know, it's like, you're probably going to be in a position where you think, Oh, I just shouldn't start. I'm going to have like nights out. I'm going to do X, Y, Z start just get back into the rhythm start yeah because uh also it looks like the weather is going to be absolutely uh beautiful for the summer if today uh, is any indicator of that i'm very hopeful anyway so uh yeah there'll be there'll be beach days tops off you know i'm personally bulking for summer you know standing up for the thick boy club but yeah uh, some of you might want to get on the fat loss path <laughs> anyway um if you're not interested in the coaching service of course that's fine maybe you just don't like us which is also completely fine but one thing we would recommend is that you give us a follow nonetheless on our social media platforms and avail of the free content we we put out okay um so you can follow us uh, on instagram myself at skinny gaz patty at the real patty farrell brian at brian ohangasa and triage of course at triage method you can see the amazing work that our clients are putting in 
Big shout out actually to my client, James McIntyre, who just yesterday did a 105 kilometer race. I'm assuming the extra five was due to like deviations in the route or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was just uh, fucking savage. He was just yeah, like, yeah, you just, know what? He just kept going. 100. <laughs> no, 105. Why not? But when I first started coaching James, you know, he um he could barely do a 5K. Like that was a real challenge. So for anyone listening, you know, you can absolutely push yourself a lot further than you think. So um, I thought that was cool. I also got my vaccine this week as well, by the way. That's a relevant piece of news that I never mentioned. And I think it just made me fucking stronger. I felt... Oh, I think it was test in there, like, because uh, she, you it know, was was, yeah, it was an intramuscular, you know, d- shot in the delt and everything. So I think she gave me a little bit of trend, you know. So one of the lads I know, he's a doctor and he's doing the 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 pinning of uh, everyone, and he's like, man, the amount of bones I've hit because obviously you can't feel your bone, you know. So like, you wouldn't even know if someone was just like straight into your bone and he's like the sound of it is the most disgusting thing ever when like because obviously like he's you know injecting like frail people like this oap 70 years old 80 years old like you obviously can't exactly know how much muscle they have versus just like yeah. in <laughs> um, and he's like oh it's the the worst sound and feeling ever on a related note or unrelated note i was tell, telling you during the week and like look fuck, we'll put it on the podcast as well i did uh one of those tests for covid antibodies um you know they're just like you know it's actually a german manufacturer company they say they're 85 to 95 percent accurate validated to like testing for covid antibodies anyway it turns out that i had covid antibodies uh igg and there was a few little igm ones going around so that supposedly is like you know you have a current infection although literally have fucking no symptoms um and i also haven't been in contact with anyone so um but yeah it was interesting to have those igg bad boys or apparently according to the test like either way i'm still getting vaccinated so it doesn't fucking matter but it's interesting to see that like you know i could have had covid and had absolutely fucking no symptoms whatsoever which is weird to think about easy work yeah i got that sweet sweet pfizer shot anyway not the pleb astrazeneca so i had no symptoms and it was great so um anyway guys uh other things you can do of course uh visit the description box below you'll see triage method newsletter triage method website triage method uh coaches corner if you're a coach yourself so get involved with all those and of course do share the podcast if you enjoy these obviously you can see we're delving into quite specific topics like we could have probably covered everything that we're going to cover in this fat loss series in one podcast but it will be very vague and you can see that in this podcast in particular we're talking about specific symptoms specific values in terms of numbers that you're hitting the specific physiology male versus female differences etc so we're trying to get quite specific so if you're enjoying it share it on your story share it with a friend privately or whatever or even if you're having a coffee with someone to celebrate the reopening you know say oh yeah i've been listening to a triage method podcast throughout lockdown and yeah um, i know everything about health and fitness now okay or leave a rating and review if your platform allows you to do so okay so other than that guys um that's us yes i will just reiterate again coaching closes in two weeks don't do not message me in two weeks three weeks and go oh can i hop in now i'm ready you're like sorry we're not We'll be ready again in sometime in October when we open again. And just on a related note, there's a lot of stuff happening in the background that I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy, but we can't reveal that yet, Gary. We, we could, but I don't think we will. Um, but there's some interesting times ahead. Um, yeah, there's a nice little vague one for you guys. Um, do you have anything else to say, Gary, before I wrap this up? No. Fantastic. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>